Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics. Uh, welcome. Uh, good to have you. I'm joined as uh, per normal by uh, Chris Dorides. Chris is the Deputy Chief Economist. Uh, how's, your, how's your week been, Chris? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. It's the last week of camp, though. So, you know, I don't know what happens after that. Oh, your kids, your kids are away at camp. Yeah, yeah. My, my son goes to day camp, and I don't know what happens next week, so... Well, we'll when see. does school start? School, unless Delta variant, I guess, has something to say. But when when should it start? Yeah, pre, his preschool starts uh, first week of September. So okay. Oh, you got a month. That, that'll be great. Yeah. yeah, good good month to bond. We'll see. Yeah. Good. And we got Ryan Sweet. Sweet. Sorry about that, Ryan. Ryan is the uh, director of real time economics. And uh, how's your child care situation? Everything okay there? Same with Chris. Last this was a, yesterday was the last day of camp. So oh, really? the next few weeks are going to be interesting. Loud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very loud. Very loud. Well, we'll keep that in mind for next the next podcast. And we have a, a, a guest, uh, Camille Kovar. Camille is joining us f- from, where are you, Camille? Are you in Prague today, right now? Are you speaking? To yeah, yeah, Prague? right now I'm in Prague. You're in Prague. And Camille, how long have you uh, been with us at Moody's? Uh, I have been with Moody's for seven years now which seems uh, like a lot to me, but I know you old timers for you, it seems like a very little, so. (laughs) (laughs) He's coming in hot, calling us old timers. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's right. Well, I am an old timer, not you guys though. Uh, Seven years, Uh, and you've been, you you came to us as a student from one of the universities there in Prague, correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I started as an intern uh, then I filled in for some maternity leave, and then and then I just didn't want to leave at all. Well, fantastic! Very good. Now, are you still are you still in school? Are you teaching? What what's your, what are you doing now? So the first rule of uh, talking to PhD students is never ask them about the status of their dissertation, uh, and you just broke it. Oh, I'm <laughs> but, sorry. I'm sorry. I, Actually, this is a good day to ask because I just sent it finalized to my supervisor. So now I will hope that the peop- other people who will read it will like it as much as I do. Oh, so this is news. You're telling us today yeah. you feel like you actually crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's. You have completed your PhD thesis. Well, as far as oh. I'm concerned, yes. But now, <laughs> now comes the, you know, <laughs> now yeah. comes the outside opinion, and that's uh, that's always tricky. The okay. feedback. It, yeah. Do you remember your th- thesis uh, defense, Chris? I do. do you remember for sure. You I think yeah. any, anyone who goes through that process yeah. has that, you know, <laughs> scar down their brain. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to forget that. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, I remember it quite vividly. Do you now? In now, since we're old timers, it sounds like we're old timers. Has have things changed, Camille? I mean, do you do you have a defense where you actually present to your committee? They ask questions and then they say you passed, or is that a thing of the past? No, that's still there. But still there. as far as my school is concerned, and I think that might be more general, is that to get to the defense, you need to you need a bunch of people to read it, right? So there are some people inside of my school who have to say it's okay. Then there are some people outside of my school who have to say that it's okay. So by the time you make it to the last point, it's more like running through the finishing line rather than than, than the hard part, I would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, congratulations. I know you've been working very hard for this. I, you know, there's nothing, look, I, I really admire your ability to work and complete a PhD thesis at the same time that is how many people do that i mean probably not many uh, that, not is many. A, that is a very difficult thing to do so uh, congratulations on that I, and uh, we're we're very happy to have you today and, and we have camille on because camille as you can imagine he does a lot of work uh, tracking what's going on in europe uh but he's also uh, our key person tracking the european central bank and that goes to uh, the podcast's big topic this week, and that is monetary policy. So we'll be talking about monetary policy in some detail here in uh, in just a bit. But as you know, uh, because you are a a um, I, I bet a um, 
a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A a, a regular a, listener. Regular or? listener. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. You I wouldn't done. have gotten that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, I've had a very bad week. Uh, th- that's part of my problem. I went on my first business trip on a plane this week since the pandemic hit. And wouldn't you know, my plane last night coming home was canceled. I'm not kidding. Literally canceled. So here I am scrambling. I forget what, what happens when your plane is canceled? What do you do exactly? You know, usually I call Sarah, my assistant, but this was kind of late. I wasn't sure. So, you know, I had to figure, I had to remember those days when you're calling the you know, American Airlines uh, 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 desk to get a thing changed and you got to get a hotel. And then, then it's dawned on me. I haven't used Uber in such a long time as my Uber, you know, it was a mess. It was a mess, but. Uh, Where'd you go? Uh, um, Milwaukee, Milwaukee. I was, um, I'm on the board of directors of a large mortgage insurer headquarters in Milwaukee. So uh, I was there for a couple of days. It, it, it was great, you know, seeing people and, just being across from them at the dinner table and, you know, interacting, but uh, now it reminds me why travel is a real bear, you know? Uh, so hopefully this isn't an omen, but anyway. So is that it? Is it, you know, is this, uh, is this it for a travel in the future or you're off it? No, no, no. I'm booking some, I'm, I'm booking some travel. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going back to, to the kind of travel I did before. That was, I mean, I enjoyed it, but in hindsight, it was over the top. You know, I'd be traveling three, maybe even four days a week. That's crazy. Uh, And not necessary in today's day and age, you know, with the Zoom. Like we have Camille on, right? I mean, we have all kinds of meetings now globally with everybody on at the same time, Zoom and other platforms. I just don't see the need, but... um, but uh, you know, I, I will get back to travel. You, you're you're starting to travel too, aren't you? I believe you are. I thought I thought you booked some travel. No, I had a, a business lunch in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, a couple. Of weeks oh, there ago. you go. <laughs> oh, that's travel. <laughs> <laughs> baby steps, baby steps. So. Yeah, yeah. You, Ryan, have you traveled yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Um, okay, let's uh, dive in. Uh, uh, part one. For the regular listener, as you know, we begin with the the data and the statistics, and uh, this was a pretty busy week. I think we got a lot of data and statistics, and we're going to get a a boatload next week, too, with the job numbers are coming out next week. We might want to talk about that a little bit as a preview, but uh, let me begin with Ryan. Uh, Ryan, uh, what's your statistic? Uh, What would you like to highlight? Uh, It was the most important number of the week and may cause us to have to change our forecast for the second half of this year. Hmm. Minus, so there's a minus, yep. 166. Oh, I, th- I know what that is. Chris, Camille, I don't expect Camille. Camille, if you no, know no, no, this, no. you no. probably should have three PhDs by now, but you, you, I, I wouldn't expect that. But I know. I think I know the answer. Chris, do you know the answer? Uh, oh, you're a coming. piker, Chris. You're such a piker. <laughs> Come on, man. Watch, watch, I have it wrong. Inventories. Correct. It's a change inventories. in inventories. Yeah, and it and was Chris enormous. Is, yeah, what was that all about? Our our, our um, tr- uh, tracking model, what did it? It had to decline, but not minus one sixty six, under sixty six billion. No, no, it was a it was a big surprise. It was a big weight yeah. on uh, second quarter GDP growth, and outside of recessions, declines of this magnitude just don't happen. And I think it gets back to the semiconductor shortage, and you saw a big drop in vehicle inventories. Uh, retail inventories are, are down a lot, and that's the shift in consumer spending away from services to goods. Uh, but, you know, this is essentially just kicking GDP down the road. You know, we're going to get an inventory rebuild, and that could really boost growth in the second half of this year, maybe first half of next. Yeah, explain for the listener kind of the connect the dots between inventories and what it means for, for GDP for growth. How does that work? Yeah, so the way they calculate it, it's, it's weird. It's the change in the change in inventories that matters for GDP growth. So next quarter, if inventor, inventories fall less than they did in the second quarter, they will actually add to GDP growth. Uh, and that, I mean, that's kind of getting in the weeds of how they, they calculate GDP. But you know, one thing that I looked at, you know, why we were you know, too optimistic on second quarter GDP, and everyone's saying it's a big disappointment. But when you get an inventory drop like that, you know they're going to have to restock. That's good for manufacturing going forward, and that's going to add to, to GDP. So 
I, I think that was far from a disappointment. I think that was a very strong second quarter GDP number uh, and suggests that we're going to get you know, more growth in the second half of this year. Yeah, the, the way I kind of explain that is GDP, gross domestic product, is the value of all the goods and services that we produce. And so if uh, you, know, you look at consumer spending, that can be strong, but if production isn't keeping up, GDP won't increase. And in fact, if consumption is outpacing production, that's when inventories de decline. But ultimately, businesses, they target a certain level of inventory. And if they're below that, at some point, they're going to ramp up production. They're going to ramp up GDP. And so that's what you're saying. We had uh, lower, uh, less of an increase in production than we thought we'd get in the quarter. But that's just drawing down inventory. Businesses are going to rebuild those inventories. And that's coming. It may not be in the current quarter, Q3, because of the global supply chain issues and other issues, but it's coming and that's going to add a lot of growth. Uh, so it's not that we didn't get the growth. We're going to get the growth we expected. It's just the timing is going to be different, a little different. Yeah. I mean, if you strip out inventories, GDP was much stronger in the second quarter. And then when you strip out uh, net exports as well, you know, and that's essentially consumption plus investment plus government, that's like the, the domestic economy that, that was booming in the second quarter. So demand is really, really strong. We just got to get you know, the production side picking up. Yeah, so just, just to back, back up a little bit. So GDP in the second quarter for the United States came out last week. It came in at 6.5% um, annualized. Uh, we were expecting 7.5. By the way, 6.5 is booming. It's just, you know, we thought it was going to boom more, 7.5. And, and the consensus was 8.5. And, and the difference, uh, reason why we came in light in large part was, this inventory uh, drawdown. Correct. Also, you mentioned uh, trade. Our trade balance deteriorated. That was another reason. And what's going on there? What? How, how do you feel about that? Is that a worry for the future or not? No, because the, the trade deficit normally widens when you get a lot of fiscal stimulus. Um, you know, we're gonna we can't produce everything that we consume. You know, from a consumption perspective. So we're going to be importing a lot of more uh, goods and services, and that's what's that's what's happening. So I'm not concerned about the deterioration of the trade deficit. Yeah, and also the fact is that the U.S. has recovered more quickly than every most everywhere else in the world, save for let's say China. And so we're uh, because we're recovering and demand is picked up, we're importing all this stuff to meet demand. But because the rest of the world is still struggling, we're not exporting as much stuff because right. they're still not consuming. But that's going to turn, presumably, you know, as we get, yeah, they get to the other time. side. Yeah. The other uh, source of weakness in the GDP, and again, remember, this is, it was really strong, boom like, it just came in a little light compared to, you know, what we expected. Uh, the other reason was uh, government spending. So, you know, that, that declined uh, overall government spending, which seems a little weird in the context of all the fiscal support that's being provided. So, what's going, what happened there and what does that mean? For the no future? idea. I, I got to look into it deeper, but the, that was another source of why our estimate was uh, a little bit high. Uh, we didn't expect it to decline in government. But the government, federal. We, federal government, it's really hard to pinpoint uh, accurately. And that's always been a source of error in, our, in the high frequency GDP model that we have, because a lot of source data does come out. We usually have a really good idea what consumption is going to be, residential investment, usually inventories, except for this time around. All the components of GDP, except for government, we have a lot of, you know, a good idea of what it's going to be. Yeah. Is that just right. a timing issue once again? All right. I, Could be. This month. Okay. Yeah, my, that'd be my sense of it. That it just when it shows up, you know, uh, in the in the in the numbers, and also we're obviously the good chance now we're going to get a lot more fiscal support coming, right? The, uh, it looks like Congress is going to pass that bipartisan infrastructure plan, $550 billion in transportation infrastructure over the next 10 years. And we've got another even more massive fiscal support package that looks like it's kind of come down the train, the two and a half, three, three and a half trillion in social investments that the Democrats are working on in Congress. So a lot more government spending coming. Um, okay. Anything else on the GDP numbers uh, that you wanted to call out, Ryan? I don't want to use too many numbers because I don't know if okay. you, know, you or Chris are going to dip into it, but GDP yeah. is now back above where it was, uh, you know, pre-pandemic. But you know, we we still haven't fully recovered. I mean, just from a GDP perspective, because if the pandemic didn't happen, GDP would have probably been two percent higher than it is today. So we still have some room for improvement. 
Hey, Camille, did you know that minus 166 was an uh, inventory? I bet, I bet you, you knew. You just didn't want to show us up. The- <laughs> well, I, I knew that the inventory is declined, but I definitely didn't remember the number. You but I would dispute that it was the most important number of the week. That that would be, of course, if you're sitting in the in the US, but from Europe, it wasn't the most important number of the week. Oh, okay. Ooh. So, okay, we're going to turn to you then. Do you have a statistic yeah. you want to uh, bring up? Uh, what, what is What do you think is the most important statistic of the week? Well, and, and, oh, I no, can, I, can I say, oh, Camille, Camille, can I just say, if one of us gets this number, <laughs> that would be impressive, wouldn't it? Well, this one is easy, and I didn't want to oh. use it as my statistic oh, because that would be just too easy for you. Okay, because go ahead. that was that was in the headlines. So, so of course it was two uh, percent, right? Which was eurozone well, GDP. Exactly right. That, that that was that's too easy. So I have a better statistic, which came out uh, also this week for for later on, and that ties in into our topic. But uh, we had a very very strong growth in eurozone, much stronger than uh, than we or or the market were expecting. So that's two two percent non annualized, which would mean more than eight percent annualized. So so we did beat right. the Americans for once. Right, right. And uh, what was the surprise in that number? What 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 caused it to be higher than expected? Well, so. This goes into the, you know, the difference in the way we work in Europe and you are guys in the US, you have all this detailed information and mm. all we get is 2%. Oh. So we don't <laughs> even know the breakdown into the components. No transparency. You know? No, jeez. So, oh, you so, get it eventually so we have, Yeah, we do, but like in a month yeah. from now. So, so mm. that's a lot of guessing up until then. But the, the important factor there was more the geographical composition because uh, Italy and Spain uh, just flew on. They, they grew by almost 3% each, non-annualized. So that's huge. Uh, opposite of that, the surprise was that Germany grew really slowly. Uh, that was very not expected if you would look at the high frequency data and everything. So, so that, that's a big puzzlement. And it might be speaking to the supply constraints, even though I, I, I don't feel like those are big enough to cause the number to be so, so much lower. But uh, overall, uh, the geographical composition was definitely the highlight in, in terms of the, of the release. Can I proffer an explanation? You know, as an economist, I can explain anything. So uh, not that it's right, but... Uh... It, tourism came back, so that helped Italy and Spain, and the vehicle industry was encumbered by the chip shortage, and uh, of course, Germany, the German economy relies very heavily on the auto industry. What, do you think that would that goes towards explaining what that, you're observing? That, that's the explanation we okay. went forward with, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially the Spain and Italy strongly suggest there was also strong growth in Greece. So, uh, so, and Portugal was also good. So, so overall, clearly the tourism season kicked in and kicked in well. Uh, the supply side constraints, the shortage of chips, it's just not big enough to shade off off like a one percentage from from GDP. It just isn't there. So it has to be something more. But it's it's hard to speculate without any further detail on the data. Well, I, I know my daughter in London helped contribute to Greece's GDP. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and it actually, remote work may be helping these guys too, because uh, they h- kind of hung out longer. My, my daughter and her uh, boyfriend hung out longer than they would typically because they could work from anywhere. Um, so... Um, a lot of people doing that. A lot of people doing yeah. that. So definitely, definitely supporting it. Overall, uh, basically, this kind of brings us to situation where, Sp- uh, where France, Germany, and uh, Italy are in a similar level of GDP relative to the pre-pandemic, uh, all together. So the heterogeneity across the countries has decreased. Is this, this quarter they they kind of aligned nicely? Spain is still farther behind before because of its sectoral composition, but uh, it, it did caught up a lot. So, so overall, it's bringing us back to situation where everybody is looking more alike. Got it. Okay, good. Were you? Did you say that that wasn't your statistic? You just brought that up because of the conversation? Did you? No, that statistic? was that was too easy. That was too easy. Oh, I have, too I have easy. Okay. One which, I have very one which ties up into our monetary policy topic. Oh well, why don't you wait? Why don't you wait? We'll, as we'll, we'll use that as a segue uh, when we get to the topic. How's that sound? Okay. That sounds good. 
Okay, very good. Chris, let's turn to you. Um, what's your statistic of the week? All right, I'm going to give you uh, two numbers, but it's the same concept, two different geographies. And this is in honor of our guest here. Right? So uh, I, wa okay. I wanted to make it fair. So Yeah, that's fair. That's good. Uh, first number, up 153%, plus 153%. Okay. The second number is down 26%, minus 26%. Wow. So here in the U.S., the, it, this is up 153 percent, and in Europe, continental Europe, you well, you didn't include the U.K. Are you including it's the not, U.K.? It's not. Is it's not Europe. It's a oh, uh, it's a country oh. in Europe. Oh, it's a country in Europe. Oh, yeah. okay. And it, it, you said it down 26 percent. Down 26 percent. Well, it, uh, is it U.K. And is it the number of new cases? It is the number of new cases, but it's not the UK. The 153% uh, increase is in the US over the last two weeks. And, uh, yeah, down, 20, was... and down 26% is the number of cases in the Czech Republic over the last two weeks. Oh, that ah. was a good one. That was a good one. Actually, um, oh, you hit home. I, I, and I give Camille credit for that. He, he went That's right good. to it. Yeah, yeah that was very good. Did. Ryan wasn't going to get that. I could see it on mm -hmm. his face. He was like sweating over there. Like, oh, this, I was yeah. thinking housing because Chris always goes I to know. housing. He always goes. To I, I got to mix it up. You know, I know you're on. Chris me, has so. three things, housing, COVID cases and crypto. That's the, that's I know. Goes. That's right. <laughs> you're exactly right. Those are In my fact, assignments. He just, a, you know? <laughs> he just wrote a great piece on global house prices. I thought it might have something to do, but 153, I couldn't, uh, that, that, not even not in quite. Boise, Idaho, they're not experiencing, <laughs> although they're getting another there. year or two, it might yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. The way things are going there. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Those are good statistics. Okay. I, I've got, I think it's pretty easy. Hmm. Um, it's two part though. Uh, it's two part. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's this week, right? Um, it, it, yeah. None of this. Yeah, uh, it is. It three is. Months ago. It, it is. It is this week because we did get a, what, as you would say, a plethora of data, good data, and the and the statistic is three point five percent. Three point five percent. Is that the year over year increase in the core PC deflator? Bingo! You got it. Very yeah. good. <laughs> three point five percent, and of course. Uh, that's high, right? I mean, the Fed through the business cycle would like to see something closer to 2%, willing to live a little with a little higher than that in the near, uh, over the near term, uh, so that through the cycle they get two, but we're at three and a half. Um, I don't know, Ryan, did you do any work decomposing that? Uh, how much of that, so uh, of that three and a half percent, or, or let's say the acceleration from two, the target to three and a half percent, is due uh, to things that are directly linked back to the pandemic, like just a normalization of prices in the in the hotel industry or uh, the increase in price vehicle prices because of the global supply chain issues. Do you, do you have a sense of that? I haven't decomposed it for the PC deflator yet because I don't think we have all the details banked yet, but I can do that. I mean, it, based on the CPI, yeah, uh, which a lot of that feeds into the PC deflator as source, source data, uh, would suggest that most of it is the reopening of the economy, the normalization of airline prices, uh, rental car prices, things like that. Yeah, of, course, of course, base effects too, right? Because it, it, Correct. I, based on the June data, this was CPI again, not PC, uh, PCE data, but June CPI, the core P, uh, CPI inflation rate, I think through June was like 4.5%, I think. But if you look at it over the past two years, so June of 2019 through June of 2021, the annualized rate, it's closer to three, which is still a little on the high side, but that, you know, that gives you a sense of how significant the decline in or the weakness in prices was this time last year in the middle of the pandemic. So the base of so-called base effects are also playing a role. Okay, here's the second part though. What is the other key statistic that came out during the week? Because I knew you'd get that one pretty quickly. What is the other key statistic that came out this week that is also 3.5%? Uh, yeah. Mm, this is a good mm, one. Uh, is it something in the GDP numbers? Nope, not GDP. 
No. Can you give Tell us me. a hint without giving it away? Uh, it's a labor market statistic. That should help a lot. Think about what labor market statistics came out during the conference week. board. But I'm trying to think, is it in the conference board survey? No, right. nope. He's, that's a good one too. Cause that showed. That was, that was really good. Yeah. To explain, explain that one. What, what, the, what did you see? The, the within the conference board survey, it's a survey of consumers, uh, consumer confidence, but they asked them about, you know, their expectations, assessment of present conditions, and there's labor market questions. And something that we look at that tracks the unemployment rate is the so-called labor market differential, which is the difference between the percent of consumers saying jobs are plentiful minus hard to get. And that differential was 44.2, I think. I might be off a yeah. little bit, but that yeah. is the highest since two, the early 2000s. So yeah, very, very high. It would say, suggest strongly that unemployment should come in pretty quickly here. By the way, can I ask just, Lightning round question. What do you expect unemployment rate to be for, for, the, for July when we get that next Friday? Do you have a number yet? Because we're at no. five, nine. I would say six. <sighs> going up? It, it's going to be, it's going to rise for the right reason though. I think we're going to pull more course. people in. Mm, interesting. Okay. I don't know. I'm not confident in that. I'm more confident in the payroll number. Okay. We'll come. Oh, well, we'll come back to that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Back to my Actually, question. 3.5%. Oh, sorry, Camille, what do you want to say? I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, uh, on this topic of unemployment rate, we have seen an uh, interesting release in Eurozone where uh, there was a large increase in labor force, but even larger increase in the, in the employment. So, so the dec un unemployment rate actually declined significantly. So it so seems like the labor markets are able to absorb all the people coming back in quite quickly, so far sure. at least. So the U.S. unemployment rate is 5.9. What is it? Is it in the eurozone? Uh, it dropped to 7.7 .7 from 8.0. Now this seems high, but you have to remember that the natural rate of unemployment rate in the eurozone is higher. So we are almost back to where we were in the beginning of 2020. We are just 0 0.3 percentage points above the pre-pandemic level. So that's very very close. Yeah, this reminds me, we got to have you back more often because there's so much to talk about with regard to Europe. I, I was going to bring up the furlough schemes there, but I don't, I don't think we have time to go down that path. We'll, we'll hold that for the next conversation. Hi, right, Chris, do you have an idea? I, I have one more stab, but I'll let Chris go first. I was thinking yeah. employment cost index. but Yep, uh, that's what I was thinking. Okay. That ECI for correct. private workers. Up that, is, that is it. Bingo, bingo, okay. bingo. Right. You got it, right? So the employment cost index, which is – probably the best measure of wages because it uh, controls for the mix of, uh, of jobs uh, occup across occupations and industries. So if you've got a, a lot of uh, uh, job loss or job growth in certain occupation industries that are uh, with wages outside the middle of the distribution, you can s s mess up your, your, your sense of what's going on with wage growth. And uh, that's not a problem with the ECI, the Employment Cost Index. And probably the best window into uh, you know, uh, the strength of the labor market uh, is uh, wage growth for uh, private industry uh, workers. And that was on a year over year basis up 3.5%. It was briefly, briefly, roughly that strong right before the financial crisis. And then you have to go back, you know, all the way into the, to the early 2000s to find a time when it was that, that strong. So very, very strong uh, wage growth labor market conditions, uh, which is not surprising. So Inflation 3.5, wage growth 3.5, but I will say, I do think wage growth will, and the strength of the wage growth will be persistent. And you know, we may even get stronger wage growth given the way the labor market's going, but the inflation rate will moderate because most of that is base effects and also the um, pandemic. And as we get through the other side of the pandemic and businesses iron out their global supply chains, people get back to work, I, I think that will come back in. Um, which was, of course, a topic for other podcasts and I'm sure for future podcasts as well. Okay, before we move on, we have each of us have uh, identified a statistic that we've been following week to week. Uh, so let's just go through that to catch everyone up. Chris, uh, your statistic is? Uh, initially, unemployment insurance claims, 400,000, uh, down 24,000 from the week before. So again, moving in the right direction, but still relatively high compared to history or uh, an equilibrium level. Um, so moving in the right direction, a little disappointing was that we had a little bit of a tick up in continuing claims. So that's also somewhat concerning, but again, 
not uh, not a time to get over to overreact at this point. Uh, initial claims are moving down, so hopefully they they continue. And Ryan, you said I think you said last week you don't use historically you have used unemployment insurance claims as an input into your estimate for job creation in the mm-hmm. monthly employment report, but you have stopped doing that because uh, of the problems, the measurement issues with regard to UI claims. Is that correct? Correct. And there's a possibility of multiple multiple filings. So. UI benefits count the number of people that file, not necessarily receive unemployment insurance benefits. And normally that's not a problem, but when you get expanded UI benefits that are, are running out, you know, states are ending them early, mm-hmm. people might be refiling. So I think it's sending a miss. I don't want to, you know, totally dis, you know, just yeah, tear apart right. versus indicator, yeah. but yeah. it's not, it's, it's hard to interpret, you know, the signal versus the noise. Well, and Ryan, you just did tear apart partisan. Yeah, I know. I know. I felt just bad. saying. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. All It'll right. be back. Hey, Chris, you can, <laughs> you can always back. change your indicator too, if you want. So you don't, you know, there's no rule here that you can't change the indicator. We should be watching if you want to do that. Uh, I don't know. When we went, once we normalize, it'll once again be a. Okay. Got uh, it. I would say by mid August, claims will be useful again. Mid, that's only two weeks from now. Yeah, so you right. should stick with it. Okay, fine. All right. Good. Hey, Ryan, uh, you've been uh, following the 10 year yield, um, one and a quarter percent. What was it last week? Was it one and a quarter percent last week? Yeah, it's actually fell today. It's down to 1.23%. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, and it dropped after the uh, PC deflator came out. It came in weaker than the consensus expected. Uh, and I think that's kind of you know, pulling inflation expectations a little bit lower. What came in weaker than expected? The core PC deflator. It did. I, that was below expectations. That, that the consensus was 0. 0.5, 0.6. And, and it came in at 0. 0.4, 0. 0.4 month to month. Which, which is what we percent. thought. Yeah. Which was our forecast, but markets were taken back a little bit that oh, you know, okay. came in later. Okay, good. So inflation expectations are coming back in. I, th- I believe so. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, um, uh, this is probably a pretty good time to ask. Uh, lightning round. Uh, what is your employment estimate for July that comes out next Friday? I'll go last. You guys can do. Oh, you guys can go first. You want to wait? Okay. I don't want to influence anybody. Oh, you, you're looking to us for employment estimates? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Chris, do you have one? I haven't uh, really. You haven't thought about it either. Not about yet. Uh, I, I haven't thought about it deeply, Brian. I mean, it would be an uneducated guesstimate. But I know you think about it all night, all day, all night. All day. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so what, can you give us a sense of it? It can change because we do get yeah. ADP on Wednesday, which is, right. you know, I, I use it. I look at it. Uh, and we get some more high frequency data. Like, uh, but right now, I'm close to a million. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. I, I, anything technical in that? Is that seasonal yeah. adjustment? Yeah. yeah, okay. Seasonal adjustment issues with leisure and hospitality and yeah. state and local government employment. Good to know. All right. It could come down. My gut is I'm I'm a high. Maybe more reasonable would be like 900, 850 see to 900. How, see how he does that? He gets he sees how we react and then you know then he starts shading it. So yeah. Well, it depends uh, what ADP does. If ADP comes out strong, I'll go weak. If it comes out weak, I'll go strong. What? Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you don't get it? That, that is rude. <laughs> yeah, a minute. He's, he's been traveling. Are you you're dissing the ADP? I'm just number. kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, you're you're allowed. You're allowed. It permitted. Yeah, that's fair. It's fair. Fair and all is fair in love and statistics, as they say. Someone said that. Um uh, okay, and my the statistic I've been following is copper prices. Did you guys notice it's back up again? Four dollars and fifty cents a, a pound. Uh, had been anything over four again is like that's a strong global economy and a lot of inflationary pressures. Uh, three is typical, uh, and anything close to two is uh, consistent with a tough economy like we had back in the teeth of the pandemic. So four four dollars and fifty cents a pound. That's about a, that's pretty that's back close pretty close to record highs. So I'm surprised to see that. Um, uh, is there anything technical going on there, Ryan or Chris, that you've noticed, or Camille? No, I, I, I didn't see anything. So, very interesting. Um, I had expect that to continue to migrate lower, but it ha- hasn't so far. Um, did you okay. see that? Did you see coffee prices dropped a lot? 
first thing I thought of was Christmas. Not. We, talk, happy. Uh, we were talking about that last week. They were high. They've come debt back in. Yeah, they dropped a lot this week. Is that just huh. technical trading? People were speculating and they got wrung out or anything else? So it was that they spiked because of the Brazil drought, right? That was the yeah. The mm-hmm. reason. Is that is not as bad as they thought it would be or? I guess. I don't uh, I'm not a... Uh, <laughs> You're not a coffee uh, <laughs> trader <laughs> on the side? See, but Ryan, all Ryan cares about is he gets his Wawa co- coffee a little cheaper, hopefully. Somewhere down the road here. Okay, Camille, do you, do you know about Wawa there in in Prague? Have you heard about Wawa? Is that, has that made it? To Prague? I heard about Wawa on one of your podcasts, oh. but we don't have it's it in, in Prague I or in Europe, you, to be honest. I'm sure, but I, it's going to come. Wawa will be everywhere, you know, at some point. So just you wait; it's coming. When you visit, could be bad. <laughs> But so, I'm not a coffee guy, so maybe it is already here, and I just don't know about it. Oh, well, what are you, are you tea guy? Uh, I'm a water guy, oh. and a beer water? guy, obviously. Oh. <laughs> did, you, did he say vodka? He's a vodka guy. Water, water. Well, water, water. Okay, I thought he said vodka. It is <laughs> all, almost ten o'clock there. I know he's drinking vodka. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's going no, on. No. That's why he's so funny. He's been drinking vodka. What do you? What do you? I'm always funny. Vodka? Are you? Are you? Do you put? Do you put anything in your with your vodka, or is it just like straight up vodka? Well, you know, when I was in vodka <laughs> stage, it. it would be straight up vodka. <laughs> but I'm not in my vodka stage anymore. I have to tell you, I just had a gin and tonic the other night. It was a mistake. I'm getting old or something. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, huge mistake. I felt it all the next day. Um, anyway. Oh, uh, back to the uh, matter at hand. Uh, so you had one other statistic you wanted to bring up in the context of monetary policy, which is where we're going next. So what's that statistic? It's a 0. 0.7. <clears throat> 0. Point, could that be monthly inflation? You know, uh, HICPA inflation <laughs> in, in the Eurozone? <laughs> So I will say that once we realize what it is, it's going to look like we coordinate it. I got it. I got it right. No, no. It's oh. you're in inflation, but it, it's something else. Well, it's year well, over year number. Oh, it is year over year. Wages? No, he's saying no. inflation was year over year 0. 0.7. Are you sure? It was not, not the headline inflation. Oh, core, oh, inflation the core? Was zero point seven. Oh, oh, core inflation was year over year is only point seven in in the eurozone. I lost track of that. Exactly. That right? Yeah, that that that's that's why I picked it because I think in all the U.S. Uh, driven narrative, people kind of think that it's very similar in eurozone. But in eurozone, we have just the headline, which is well high, well above two percent, but not much yeah. high, right? Yeah. But zero point seven is the core, and it hasn't gone above one percent at all so 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 we are in very very different situation and and sometimes i see a market commentary like you know inflation is high it's putting up pressure on ecb and i'm like well the inflation is really low if you strip out the you know energy and food so why would there be any pressure on ecb right that's i knew it was low but i thought it would start to pick up now that europe is recovering and i would have thought the same kind of dynamics are starting to take hold there with demand and supply but not so. That's not what's happening. At least not yet, right? That's a... Yeah, you're not seeing airline fees go up, ticket price go up. You're not seeing hotel room rates go up. You're not seeing rental car. You're not seeing any of that. So, oh. so there, we might be behind a bit, so it might uh-huh. come. That's one thing. But I would. my suspicion is that it might also be a measurement issue. Like I, I, my feeling is, for example, that the car prices did go up in Europe pretty much, mm-hmm. maybe not as much as US, but quite a bit, at least, mm-hmm. you know, reading, uh, reading news analysis and all that. But I don't think it's showing up in the inflation data per se. So I, I think it might be just that the statistical office is hard, having, is having harder time measuring this stuff in Europe than in US, where you have such a good, you know, high quality, high frequency data. Ah, that, that's interesting. Well, in the UK, it's somewhere in between, right? It, it's uh, I think inflation is like 
it's up, but it's like two and a half to three. It's not four and a half to yeah, five. It's, yeah. No, no, no. It's it's yeah. below three. It's somewhere in between the UK. UK is somewhere in between the US and the EC in the Eurozone. But uh, okay, that's a good, that was a good statistic. Very good. And that is a good segue into the talk uh, discussion around monetary policy. And I guess I wanted to begin with just, uh, and I should also point out, I, I didn't mention this, but Ryan, in addition to his, his work as a, a tracking real-time statistics, also is a, a key observer of what's going on at the Fed. And so I'm going to ask Ryan first, and then you, uh, Camille, for your assessment of how the Fed and ECB have done uh, during the pandemic. Uh, what, what, what kind of grade would you give them and why? So Ryan, wh what about the Fed? What kind of grade would you give them? There's, there's no other grade than an A+. Plus. I mean, a plus. the way they responded that quickly, they, they took interest rates down to zero. They didn't you know, hesitate, reopened all the credit facilities. I mean, the, the, the advantage the Fed had this time around is that they had these facilities, they were time tested during the financial crisis, and then they just launched them. And you know, that helped calm financial markets. And then they also got creative with additional lending facilities. So in the end, I think you know, the Fed really did exactly what they needed to do. Keep Chris, markets you, functioning. Yeah. Chris, would you push back on that A plus at all? I mean, maybe I mean, a harder grader. Maybe an A. an A. Yeah. Why not the plus? Why wouldn't you give them the plus? Uh, you know, you could always do a little bit more. But, but I, I agree really with, uh, with Ryan's sentiment here. That they did right. everything within their pop, perhaps, you know. Maybe even a little bit beyond with uh, expanding into the corporate bond market. It, they also have some limitations in terms of their powers, right? So, right. Well, I, I, I would give them an A plus, but I'd say uh, still uh, the semester, the uh, class is not over yet, right? I mean, the pandemic is not over. And then, and to really get an A plus, you have to norm, get everything back to normal, right? Get, get rates, get NQE, start winding it down, uh, get, uh, short-term rates back to something more uh, consistent with the well-functioning economy. And that may actually turn out to be the hard part. You know, uh, it's one thing to step on the accelerator. It's another thing, and, you know, keep, keep the car moving, so to speak, but it's another, take your foot off and keep the, let, and make, and, and, and make sure that car is still uh, going down the highway as it should. So we'll see, but I, I think you're right. I, I would agree with you a plus so far, but incomplete. Right. And, Camille, I know you're a tougher oh, grader. Gosh. You're, you're, you're a tough grader. Yeah, uh, right. So, how would you rate the EC? What kind of grade would you give the ECB for their conduct during the uh, pandemic? Well, B, but turning into B minus, I would say. Ooh. So okay. they they started bad. They had a stumble in the very beginning of the March, which was a communication error up to some point, but uh, they did get their act together very quickly. And then they did get innovative and they pushed their political limits pretty well, pretty far. So, so that, that was definitely good, but because of the stumble, that cannot be an A, that has to be at least a B. The reason why I'm going into minus is because, you know, what's up with the being complacent when your inflation outlook is so bad? The ECB projection right now has inflation at the end of 2023 at 1.5 and they're not doing anything. They'll, you know, it's like, well, if you are not hitting your target within two years, shouldn't you do something? Or, that's, or two and a half years even. So, so it's more like right now they should probably do more. I know it's politically tricky, but you know, that's, I'm not grading the politics here, I'm grading the conduct. Well, I don't know if that, let me ask you it this way: though. taking in consideration the political constraints, do you still give them a B going on B minus? Still B. I will, you know, I will wait another half year with the with the minus. Maybe Lagarde will surprise me and and uh, and show some strength in the I, next half year. I I have two questions based on what you said. The first is, what was the communication error they made they made back in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit? What was that error you're referring to? Uh, so in March, Lagarde said 
the truth and you should never say the truth as a best central banker. Lagarde is the Lagarde is the, uh, the, the president. Uh, yeah, the president uh, of ECB, and she said that ECB is not here to you know uh, control the spreads or or you know push down the spreads of the government bonds. And of course, the reaction was everybody going crazy and spreads going through the roof. Uh, we had a uh, one percentage point move in an Italian spread during a few days. So that, that was huge. And they reacted a couple of days later with a massive action. So, so they kind of mopped up the communication error pretty quickly. So, so that, that, that deserves a B. Make a mistake, but fix it. That's good. I have a good story about the ECB. I'm going to tell it real quick, and then I'm going to ask you the second question. So, uh, I, you know, I've been to the ECB a number of times. They asked me to come in. This was uh, after the f- kind of after the financial crisis, maybe a few years after the crisis hit, and there was still a lot of debate about what they should be doing around monetary policy. The debate was around quantitative easing uh, and whether they should uh, QE in some form. And so I go into uh, a s- small conference room. This is you know, obviously when we still got into conference rooms as a group and it, in the meeting, they had, uh, and I guess it's very common in all um, ECB meetings, they have two representatives from each country uh, there. So two Italians, two Spaniards, two Germans, two French, so forth and so on. And I made a very strong case that that they needed to be more aggressive and they should you know, ramp up their QE and that they were being too slow, and of course the German, the the, um, the, the Spanish uh, representatives, the Italian representatives, were shaking their heads up and down. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, after the I gave my talk, I felt pretty good about it, and I was just standing there, you know, talking with someone when one of the German representatives came over. This guy was six seven, looking straight down at me, and he goes, you, you know, in a strong, perfect English but strong German accent, he said, and I'm, I may have this not exactly right, but basically he says, you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and it, it, you don't know anything because you said uh, Chairman uh, Draghi, you know, and it's President Draghi. And I said, Chairman Draghi. You know, of course, chair, it's the chair, <laughs> Chairman at the Federal Reserve, it's President at the ECB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that I said Chairman, I, that was a disqualifying event, you know, because everything <laughs> else, else I said was, was worthless you know, because of that. Uh, That's a B minus uh, right there. B minus right there. <laughs> but those guys, so they, they the, the, uh, the German representatives were dead set against you know that kind of uh, support. You know, for the thought what's more stressful, presenting before the ECB or the Fed or Congress? Uh, it's pro- it's it's probably more stressful presenting before the Fed uh, because I don't. Um, because uh, I don't know what I don't know when I'm speaking to the ECB. <laughs> I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, there's things I don't know, but I don't care. You know, it's okay. But uh, I don't have all the nuance, right? I don't have all mm-hmm. the political nuance and, you know, all the nuance. So, and they, you know, I'm speaking more in broad terms. So if you're at the Fed, though, you're speaking with very clear, significant granularity, right? So it's a little bit more nerve wracking. Uh, anyway, um, okay. Uh, I did want to ask though your view. Uh, and going back to Camille, this is uh, uh, about your your point that they need to do more. The ECB needs to do more. What can they do? Uh, I mean, what do you think of negative interest rates? I mean, do you think they have been helpful at all? And can you go even more negative? And if you're not going negative rates, what else do you have in mind when you say do more? Uh, so this is a tricky discussion, but I think it was just made easier a couple of weeks ago uh, because a couple of weeks ago, we concluded the strategic review of ECB, right? And they changed the inflation target from the very confusing and horrible below, close but below 2%. To two percent symmetrically, right? So that's a good step in a dark direction, but you can make more, right? Uh, I think it's clear that we have structural problem in eurozone right now with inflation expectations being below two percent. So let's change it up. Let's change the strategy and go for what the Fed did, right? Why, why, why wouldn't we do that? So we could do more, probably not in terms of the tools per se, that, that, that's a bit pushing on a string, but we could do more in terms of, you know, how we 
set the big picture and that's going to influence the expectations and behavior of agents, right? So, so in that way, we could do more. So okay, in my opinion, you... oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, just to give context, because you, you said a lot, just so for people to understand. <laughs> so the, the, both the European Central Bank and the Fed since the end of last year have changed the, their framework for conducting monetary policy, for setting interest rates and, and other policy. The Fed changed uh, the framework so that now their inflation target is 2% on the core consumer expenditure deflator through the business cycle. So that means if, if you're below two for an extended period, you need to be above two for an extended period to be on average equal to two. And by the way, in my mind, that makes perfect sense because just doing the arithmetic, I won't go into it, but it, you know, if you don't have that kind of policy, you'll never get to two because inflation expectations will never get to two. So, but anyway, that's, that's a whole nother discussion. Exactly. The but the ECB previously before the change in, in the last couple of weeks was the 2%, they had a 2% target on inflation, but it was a ceiling. We're not going over 2%. It was a hard ceiling. And, and of course, we're well below two for an extended period. And, and, and now they're still not willing to have 2% through the cycle. They're, they're not saying I have a hard ceiling anymore. I can go over two, but they're not saying on average through the business cycle too. And you're saying, well, why? Why are you doing that? It makes no sense. Uh, you should have uh, the same similar framework uh, as the Fed. Do I, do I have that right? Did, did I get that right? Exactly right. And you think that's and exactly for the exactly for the reason you said right. It's uh, if you say, well, you know, it's two percent, but if we miss, it's not something we will do about it, right? Which kind of makes you stuck, especially if you are starting from below two percent. It kind of doesn't make you go much higher, right? While Fed makes it clear, well, you know, if we miss, we will make it up for, for it, which makes people expect, well, you know, they might miss, but we will get there eventually. So that makes your expectations very different. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I just wonder if that really, do you think that's a big enough deal that that would make a difference, that it would really have an impact on? I think so. I, you think I mean, I, I, I'm not saying we would go to 2%, to, you know, in span of a month, mm -hmm. but uh, it would help us in, in medium term for sure. And right now ECB expects that it's going to be undershooting for another two and a half years. That's, uh, right, that's that doesn't time. seem like being, you know, being very serious about hitting 2%. What do you think about negative rates? Of course, in, in Europe, uh, rates, interest rates have gone negative. The, uh, uh, in Japan, they're negative. The U.S. Fed never took the short-term interest rates that controls the, into negative territory. There's a zero lower bound that goes to zero, but no lower. Uh, how do you think negative rates have the, well, of course, the idea was negative rates would help to uh, incent the banking system and other financial institutions to extend out credit because if they, you know, have to pay the, the central bank uh, 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 an interest uh, on on the funds that they that they're that they're not that they're not uh, lending out, uh, that's a penalty, and therefore they have an incentive to go out and lend the money, and that would create more economic activity. That's the theory behind negative interest rates. How do, how do you think, what do you think about that? How did that work out? Well, I think it's hard to argue that they were not helpful. They were helpful, but of course, marginally. So we, we decreased by half a percentage point. So that's that's not a terribly lot, but still better than nothing. Uh, but as you hinted earlier, there are limits to this approach to negative rates, right? Uh, lowering what is called the deposit rate farther at some point you start hurting the bank's profitability and that might be counterproductive. So, so I think we hit the right spot in the amount we went and it helped, it helped a little, it didn't help a terribly lot, but you know, a little better than none. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ryan, do you think the Fed is wrong not to go negative on rates? No, no. I think the, the only thing they hate more than negative interest rates is these, these cryptocurrencies. But the Fed has always stressed that they don't want to adopt negative interest rates, uh, partly because unlike in Europe, our, our money market, uh, part of our financial system is, is really large. And they're worried that if you go negative Fed funds rate, that that could cause a lot of disruptions in, in the money market. Right, because the money markets, they can't make any money 
and if they can't make money, they uh, uh, they break the so-called buck. If they break right. the buck, then that just will create chaos because the money market funds are a key source of, of cash liquidity to businesses and households. They 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 are key to the the flow of funds within the financial system. And if they're broken, right. then the system is going to be broken. Right. And if they didn't go negative during the pandemic, it's hard to see them ever adopting ever, negative ever interest adopting rates. So I, I think agree, agree you know, we, have, we have this whole laundry list of tools that they can do during a recession and negative interest rates is probably at the bottom. Right. Well, what do you, now, of course, they are, have wholeheartedly uh, embraced quantitative easing, you know, as another tool. And QE is simply buying longer term bonds. So they, you know, the traditional monetary policy kind of in typical times, they are managing short-term interest rates or buying and selling short-term securities. Uh, but once short-term interest rates get to the zero lower bound, then they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to now start trying to get long-term interest rates down and that's QE by buying, buying bonds. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of QE? I think it was really successful. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do. I mean, not only just bringing down long-term interest rates, but, you know, when you lower long-term rates, you're going to push investors into the stock market, which is going to boost stock prices and help spending through the wealth effect. So I think QE has been effective and I think it's a permanent tool now with the Fed. Yeah. Chris, do you have a different perspective on that or any, anything you want to add on the QE? Uh, I'd agree. I think, um, I think overall, right. The Fed is uh, the fireman of the, of the, of the economy and they need to have all these tools, but they're not the most precise tools, right? You, you take the axe, you take the hose, right? They're good tools to have, but um, you know, in a crisis, that's exactly what you need. You can't wait for Congress to act and produce the, or provide the, the fiscal stimulus that might provide support to the economy. So I think QE is a useful tool. It's kind of proven itself. And um, yeah, I think we would have been in a far worse situation without it. So, yeah. Just like how you yeah. guys wouldn't give vet, you're saying that it's incomplete. I mean, QE is still incomplete because they got to unwind this MBS holdings, these mortgage-backed securities that they have on their balance sheet, which is a massive amount. Uh, and it's unclear how they're going to do that. But they just keep kicking the can down the road. I mean, that's you know a long way off that they have to address this. But at some point, they are going to have to address their MBS holdings. So at what so, point? What's your, what's your forecast? I, I was always thought that they would do this new Fed... Uh, uh, repeat of the Fed Treasury Accord, where you know, the, uh, the Treasury take all the MBS and then in return, just give the Fed Treasuries, because that's what they want their balance sheet to be mostly is Treasuries. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and when we're talking this massive amount of MBS, and I just don't know how they're going to do it. Why? Why? I'm a little confused by that. I mean, just, I mean, they, they just let it a mature, let, mortgage backed securities are securities that are backed by single family mortgages that are guaranteed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, and USDA, government-backed institutions or government entities. Why, why, what's the problem with just letting the mortgage securities just mature or prepay, you know, just through refinancing? Oh, no. activity? Well, it, it, that would cause their balance sheet to decline if you don't replace it with something. So they could do, you know, replace the MBS that's maturing with treasuries, but that could, that's a, that's a lot down, coming and that's going to cause problems. But again, this isn't something that's next year, 10 years from now, it's like, it's way down the road. But if you let the MBS just roll off, that's going to be a significant amount of uh, monetary tightening because their balance sheet's going to you know, drop quite significantly. Well, they did that after the financial crisis, right? A I mean, little they, bit. Their balance sheet dipped. Like it did not, con I wouldn't yeah. even say it really contracted that much. And then right. they got nervous because it's, you know, financial market conditions were tightening, the economy was slowing down. So they, they stopped that and they, you know, stabilized their balance sheet. So you don't uh, seem you don't seem convinced. Mm, I, I'm not overly worried about it. No. By the time uh, that we have to uh, have a podcast on this, you'll be on the beach somewhere, you know, retired. I mean, it is a long ways off. Did you? He just called me. Did you hear wow. that? That you know, it's 2040. Saying, <laughs> it's like I think it's 2040, 2050 that this is going to be. First Camille, now Ryan, Chris and Chris. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. All right. Hey Camille, do you have a view on QE, the the, the European style QE? Well, I, I wonder what's there not to like, right? Uh, not much downside, okay. definitely yeah. some upside, right? 
yeah. uh, there might be problems down the road right because with the large balance sheets if you start raising rates it means that in in the european center, uh, central bank world you start paying large money to banks who have uh, these deposits at the central bank so that could create political tensions but yeah that's a worry for the next decade or more likely the decade after that so probably not a big worry yeah i'm with you on that so uh, there's two potential worries which I think we've kind of alluded to. One is, well, how do you kind of wind this down? I mean, right now the Federal Reserve through its quantitative easing, its bond buying, is buying $120 billion of securities every month, 80 billion in treasury securities, 40 billion in mortgage-backed securities, MBS. And you know they're coming up to a place where they're gonna start talking about what they say, tapering QE, which means buy, fewer bonds each month. So instead of 120 billion by, I don't know, 110 billion, and then a few months down the road, 100 billion, so forth and so on. And that could be tricky, right, Ryan? And because the last time we were here in 2013, when coming out of the financial crisis, the Fed had been QEing and was now starting to thinking about tapering QE. That didn't go so well, right? No, so we that, had the, t- the so-called taper tantrum where, you know, Bernanke kind of had a foot and mouth moment where he hinted that you know, or Marcus interpreted his comments that tapering was going to start sooner than they had anticipated. I don't think we're going to have a taper tantrum this time around. I mean, the Fed is doing everything that they can to make sure that nobody is surprised when the tapering process starts. They dropped their first hint in uh, the last FOMC post-meeting statement, uh, and another hint's politically coming in either August when Powell speaks at Jackson Hole or at the September meeting. So you, they're, they're going to start talking about tapering uh, in right. the next couple of months, not, not August, but you're thinking September, they'll start talking about it. They'll start. Yeah. That, that, that's when they'll make the first, you know, provide yeah. a little bit more clarity. So they're going to talk the yeah. talk for a few months yeah. and then they'll walk the walk with actually tapering early next year. And in, in, in our forecast, we're saying January of next year. Does Correct. That sound right to you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. So, so, uh, one thing to be nervous about, maybe not to dislike, but to be nervous about is how do you get out of this gracefully? I, you know, you're buying all these bonds and, you know, if you stop buying all these bonds, what does that mean for the bond market, for interest rates, for the broader economy? So that's one thing to consider. I, I did want to, this might be really getting into the weeds, but uh, there was an interesting development at the FOMC meeting. That's the open market committee meeting of the Federal Reserve that sets monetary policy. Uh, they did it this week, and one of the reasons why we're talking about monetary policy this week was they they established a new standing repo facility. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, you want to you want to explain what that is and, and, and what that's all about, and how important that is. Yeah, it, it, the way to think about this is, I mean, they had a facility that was very similar to this. It's just now becoming a permanent uh, tool for the Fed. It's basically. Part of their lender of last resort. I mean, they're now the lender of last resort uh, for the repo market. And what what's creative about this is now it gives banks a place where they can easily, you know, park their cash uh, at the Fed uh, or tap it without you know going through the discount window, which has this stigma that you know if a bank goes to the discount window, there's there's financial issues. Uh, so this standing repo facility is uh, a way for banks to park their reserves and. Uh, earn a little bit of a return at the at the Federal Reserve. So uh, this is kind of how I'm thinking about. It. Tell me if I've had, I have this right. I could I could have it wrong. That you know the uh, thing about this the standing repo facility is that if, if the Fed stops buying as many Treasury or securities or more MBS, they need someone else to step in and start buying. Otherwise, interest rates might rise more quickly than anticipated. They're giving the banking system a kind of easy way to do this, a profitable way to do this. So that, that a bank can take a treasury, say a 10 year treasury at one and a quarter percent, they can uh, repo it, which means they use the treasuries as collateral. They fund, basically fund the, the ownership of that treasury with, uh, with, the, the, uh, with the repo facility. And it can, the cost of those funds is very low. So I think they set the interest rate on that facility at at a quarter point. So think about that. I can I can borrow at a quarter point. I can then buy an asset, a treasury, 
at one and a quarter point, or I can buy an MBS. I don't know what they're probably going at for 175 on the, on the run mortgage backed security. And that's without much, very little risk there. And I can book a lot of money. I can make money doing that. Right. So that's a really strong incentive to get the banks to kind of step into any void that's created by the Fed pulling back from its bond buying, its quantitative easing. Right, exactly. Is, is that like right? The, yeah, this is like the first step towards actually beginning to taper. They're, they're setting up, you know, a mechanism where, you know, if something does go wrong, you know, they can address any liquidity issues uh, right away. Because this facility won't be used in, in normal times. It's only going to be used in periods where there's financial stress. Oh, well, I guess right now, it might, it's going to be used now, right? Because there's going to be, as they try to taper, there's going to be... Right. Okay. You, well, I guess right. we're still in a period of stress is what you're saying. Correct. There's still stress in the system, but I mean, yeah. you know, down the road... It's when, still not normal. It's still not right. normal. When we're back yeah. to normal, this, no one's going to be tapping this facility. Yeah. Okay. Here's the other thing that people complain about when they think about... They, well, people complain about everything, you know, about the Fed and QE. Most of it, I think uh, Camille said it right, what's not to like about QE. So it's just, you know just moaning uh, without much merit. Uh, but one concern that may be reasonable is that QE is jacking up asset prices, right? It's bringing down long-term interest rates. Long-term interest rates are key to uh, all asset valuations, I mean, stock prices, uh, you know, bond prices, uh, real estate values, housing values, you know, what's going on in the crypto market, uh, you know, all those things have been juiced up by, uh, by the QE, and uh, that's a problem. What do you think of that concern? Is that a reasonable concern? And by the way, Camille, is that, is that narrative I just described, is that even part of the debate discussion in Europe? Do, or do people worry about that in Europe? Of course they do. That's, that's the one thing I don't like about QE, and that's a lot of people are using it as, to me, sometimes an excuse for prices of assets they didn't expect. So they are like, mm, I thought it should be lower. It must be QE, which is, of course, a, a genius excuse because you can always always use it. But personally, I, I was always very skeptical. There is a part true to that story, and that's what you described, right? I mean, if long-term interest rates are lower, then assets should be higher. But that's not talking about tens of percentage points. And people usually say, you know, the central banks, they bought trillions of dollars of assets, and that's why the stock markets are so high. And if you look at the numbers, it just doesn't add up. So Fed, for example, they bought a four trillion of assets since the start of pandemic, which sounds like a lot. But if you think about it, the value of the stock market in US is 50 trillion and the value of the bond market in US is another 50 trillion. So even if it would be mechanical, we are talking about the 4% of the valuation. So that, that just doesn't add up as like, you know, as you know, that's why the stock markets went up by 20, 30%. So I was always skeptical of this argument uh, being used personally. Well, it's, it's kind of weird what he said, isn't it? He, he says, is, he, you, you're okay with QE and you think this criticism of QE about jacking up asset prices and making stock prices and housing values overvalued, is you're, you have no problem with that. You're just mad that people use that as an excuse to explain away the higher asset prices. That's what you're mad about. Exactly. Yeah. That's a, Chris, do you find it's that a, weird? That's a little weird. That is a little me. weird. <laughs> the lower, lower interest rates are fueling the speculative bubbles, but the Fed is not responsible for those lower interest rates in any way. Is that is that the just no? I, no, I'm I'm saying yeah, they they are not the speculative bubbles are not the result of Fed behavior, at least to my mind. Yeah. I, I was just saying, you know, like. The, I don't like that PPQ use QE as an argument for why the yeah. S&P 500 went up by 30%. But that, yeah. that, that's just bogus. Yeah, I, I hear you. You're, you're, you're mad at other economists and market <laughs> pundits that are using QE you know, as an excuse for everything. Yeah. Yeah, I would market agree. pundits. He I said would it agree. right. I mean, there's that awful chart that people use. It's like the S&P 500, the level, versus the Fed's balance sheet. You know, yeah. and they go, you know, oh, it, yeah. like a right up. But there's no causal relationship between. No, them. yes, that's always the ca causation or correlation. 
Yeah. Right, exactly. And that that chart just drives me nuts. Yeah. Well, you're both weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're getting we're getting down to the end here, and I do want to uh, look a little forward. We we, we got we, we heard from uh, Ryan about uh, QE and tapering QE beginning early next year. Uh, but when do you think the ECB and Fed will actually begin to take their foot off of the accelerator and start normalizing short term interest rates? Uh, who wants to go first, Camille? Do you want to go first? Or do you want Ryan to go first? Uh, I can go first. Okay, uh, go, so go uh, uh, I think it's pretty clear it's not going to happen in 2022 20, unless something crazy happens. E ECB, uh, we're talking ECB now. Yeah, ECB. The deposit, ECB. Rate, the, the deposit rate, we're talk you're talking about the deposit rate for the, for the ECB controls. So no, no rate hikes in 2022. And most likely not 23. It, it would really have to be extraordinary rebound in economic activity and rise in prices to change that. But it's very, very unlikely. Uh, basically, we are talking sometime in 2024, uh, the earliest, of course, if things go according to plan. We personally in Moody's, we have a fall of 2020-24. It could be sooner, but it could, of course, go be later. And, after all, we haven't seen a rate hike in Europe in 10 years. So predicting a rate hike is a tricky business down here. That's an interesting point. I had, I had, I had forgotten that. There hasn't been a rate hike in 10 years. Wow. Yep. That, that should be longer. They shouldn't have raised rates in 2000. No, you're right. You're exactly right. They made a huge error when they raised rates in, in 09, I believe, right? It was 09. Oh, oh, 08 and 2011. Both. Oh, 11. 2011 is what I was thinking about. Yeah, yep. that was crazy. That was crazy. Um, that's when I was at the ECB when they, when they were. Uh, I was right going to ask that and yeah. push yeah. the envelope. Yeah, I, I thought that was just nuts. Uh, of course, in hindsight, it was nuts. Uh, just a huge, <laughs> um, huge. So, so you're saying the the first rate hike would is likely in 2024, is what you're saying. Three years from now. Yes. Okay, and. And what do you think the inflation rate and unemployment rate will be when that happens, when they start raising rates? So the unemployment rate, you uh, said, is 7.6, I think you said? 7.7 7 now. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at 7.4 in the beginning of pandemic. We yeah. will get back to around 7, maybe even lower. It seems like some of the structural changes have helped to bring the natural rate down. So we might go around 7, maybe slightly below 7, in uh, next uh, year to two years. Inflation, however, right now, it's gonna continue to go up because of base effects. But come January, there is gonna be a large drop as the tax changes and, and other issues will, will disappear from the comparison. So then in 2022 and 2023, we will be you know, somewhere around 1.1 to 1.5. And only in 24, we will probably start converging to, to 2%. So your, your thinking is they will not raise rates until we're close to 2%, or it's very obvious we're getting to 2% in European inflation. And that, unemployment sub-7, you know, pretty close to its, its full employment level. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we, we will have unemployment rate at, at the natural level. And then we need some for the for the inflationary pressures to build up. So so okay. it's gonna be a while. Twenty twenty four. Okay, okay, Ryan. Uh, and I should preface this by saying that Ryan is probably wrong, but you know we want to hear from Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask. Do you want me to explain what our forecast is, or what will actually happen? Oh, I want you to say wow. three things. Right, here's three things. One, first, tell me what the market expects. What do investors think? Two, uh, what first are, quarter of all the way second, two, three things. Second, uh, tell uh, what what our official forecast is. You know that with this consensus view. Maybe I have a stronger vote than most, but it's consensus view on the federal funds rate. And then third, your view. So go ahead, okay. fire away. All right, I might I might need some support from Chris on this one, but the market's expectation is uh, first quarter of twenty. Uh, 23. Okay. They kind of ebb and flow between late 2022 and early 2023, but for the most part, they're right around there. 
our official forecast is also first quarter of 2023. Right. Uh, and we got there first, right? We got, we got there, there first. Yes. I, I do give you credit Wait. for that. We've been there. You've been there for a while. A while. Uh, yeah. But assuming that Powell's still chair of the Federal Reserve, I think it's going to be late 2023 before they raise interest rates. You do. Okay. So the reason the market in, I think, early 2023 is because we think the economy is going to be at full employment. That's a, you know, mid 3% unemployment rate. And inflation is going to be consistently above, just above its 2% target by early 2023. So is it that your forecast for when we get to full employment and the inflation rate different than that? It's a little bit later. And also I think okay. the, the Fed has clearly sent the message that they're going to run this economy hot to kind of you know uh, get to the labor market that we had pre-pandemic. And it's not just the unemployment rate. They're going to look at minority unemployment rates. They're going to look at uh, employment to population ratios. Like they're going to have a, a whole slew of things that they're going to look at to assess where the labor market is. And they're, they're hell-bent on getting back to where we were pre-pandemic. And I just think that we'll get there. It's just it may take a little bit longer than you know, what our official forecast has. Right. Okay. And Chris, Chris, do you have a different Chris, back me up. Yeah. What do you think, Chris? Uh, yeah, I think the I think the baseline is right. I think uh, you shifted on me. <laughs> no, no. Did he? No, no. Did I've, I've been consistent. I've always. Are you were, are you were late twenty twenty three? No. Oh. Early twenty twenty three. I think inflation might be a little hotter than what you're saying. Mm -hmm. and that's why they uh, they act more quickly, but. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, uh, I do worry about asset prices though, between now and then, if you keep the foot on the accelerator for too long, given where asset prices are now, just think what they're going to be a year or two from now. Uh, it's, I don't know. Um, going to be tough to, tough to uh, avoid raising rates uh, for very long, but we'll, but you know, reasonable debate. And uh, of course we're going to be debating this for a long time to come. Anything else on monetary policy, um, you guys want to bring up before we uh, sign off? Uh, Camille, Chris, Ryan, anything? We, we didn't talk about crypto. We didn't talk about digital currency, which is actually a very interesting topic that's kind of come to the fore for central banks. And we're going to do that. I, we're going to, I'm going to have a guest on uh, 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 to help us with that, uh, external guest uh, to help us with that. Um, any other issues that you wanted to bring up, though, before we move on? No, I think we tackled you know? it. We did? Okay, good. Uh, I do want to remind everybody, uh, you can go to economy.com, uh, go to, uh, when you're there, Inside Economics, and uh, you'll be able to let us know what you think, what topics you think we should tackle. We're you know, very keen on that. We're listening to you. Uh, apparently, a lot of people want to talk about China in the US uh, relationship, and I got a great guest for for that, uh, this fellow named Dan Rosen from the Rhodium Group, who's just, at, he just wrote a piece in the uh, Foreign Affairs and he's really, I know him quite well, he's really very good. And so he's gonna, gonna be a good guest for that. But I'd like to hear from you, let us know what you want, what, you want, what topics you'd like us to, uh, to opine about in, on the podcast and we'd be very happy to do that. So uh, uh, with that, um, let's, let's call it a podcast. Uh, thank you everyone, catch you next week.